Welcome to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee's 19th meeting of 2019. Before we move on to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone to either switch off their phones or put them on silent as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to continue its financial scrutiny work. This morning we'll be considering how fiscal measures could be used to improve environmental outcomes and promote positive behaviour change. And I am delighted to welcome uh, Jacqueline Cottrell, the Senior Policy Advisor for Green Budget Europe, Martin Nesbitt, the UK Director for the Institute for European Environmental Policy, Jenny Hume, the Campaign Manager for Have You Got the Bottle, Callum Blackburn, Head of Policy for Research and Valuation of Zero Waste Scotland, and Michael Cook, Chief Executive Officer for Community Resources Network Scotland. Good morning to you all. Now, I'm going to start by um, asking a question, which maybe not all of you um, might not feel able to, to, to um, answer, but those of you that can, I'm interested to know your thoughts. We've got a situation, obviously, in Scotland where we don't have all the powers around everything that we could possibly do to, to improve those outcomes. Um, I guess I want to ask a broad question around that, whether the Scottish Parliament, you believe, has the devolved powers it needs to introduce environmental taxes and charges to support um, the policy obje objectives around this portfolio. If anyone wants to go in first. Um. You don't have to press the button, it's all right. done for you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I, yeah, Callum from uh, uh, Zero Waste Scotland. Um, I think the, uh, uh, what we, I suppose that fiscal measures are one, one aspect and um, one of the things that we do have is powers around things like producer responsibility, etc. And those, those fiscal measures can be very effective, particularly if we're looking at um, prevention and trying to get the redesign of materials so they can be more recycled. So um, from that perspective, there are a range of things that we can do. Um, and we should remember as well that in terms of fiscal measures, usually you, what you want to do is have a holistic package. So it might not be one measure on its own, but a range of things, including um, behaviour change actions and other action around procurement, for example, which is a big thing that we have control over. Um, so you can uh, create a package um, which focuses around some of the things that we um, we do have the competence for. All right. Would anyone else like to tackle the issue of taxes? Yes, Mr. Nesbitt. On Callum's point around a holistic package of measures, that's one of the things that we found uh, in some of the research we've done on environmental taxes across um, EU member states is most important in the success of those taxes. It's being able to demonstrate that um, your environmental um, levy or tax is part of a wider package um, that takes into account social <coughs> issues, economic issues and so forth. That makes it more challenging to do at um, a sub-member state level. Um, so you have, to, you have to kind of knit together that package from the elements which are under your control and you have... Um, you know, uh, an element of lack of control in that someone else might then take a subsequent decision on other parts of the, the tax package which disrupt your, your, your overall cohesive <coughs> package. So I think it's more challenging at a sub-member state level, but it's certainly still possible. Um, anyone else want to tackle that? Uh, Michael Cook? Um, yeah, I'm mean, going to support what's been, been said. Um, we've seen evidence of, of changes <coughs> in the past, such as the carrier bag charge and in the present with deposit return scheme coming through where a relatively small in both those cases levy can nudge consumer behavior and send clear signals which has um, clear environmental benefits i think the thing we would like to see is not just discourage the neg negative but encourage the positive and recognizing that, that tax and fiscal measures can only achieve so much as, as callum said um, and when you take into account the whole of the waste hierarchy, how you're encouraging reuse and repair, for example, at the top end, not just discouraging landfill, and um, then um, some of those tax powers clearly less, uh, rest south of the border or indeed in, in Brussels currently. So it's, it's recognising that, say, VAT or something like that that could, could do that is a European-wide issue. Ask about that. Um, I mean, is there immediately anything that you think, well, if that, had, if that was actually rested with the Scottish government... The, that's a barrier removed in which they could take 
real meaningful action in a particular area. You mentioned VAT there. Is there anything else that springs to mind that it would make a meaningful difference? If Obviously, things have got consequences, but is there any tax that you think, if that was at Scotland level, could be deployed um, usefully? I mean, we obviously don't have a view. It's above our pay grade, so to speak, right, for, okay. to, to comment on where the power should rest. But the, the point would be that we would make would be that it needs a holistic response, right. and, and that requires thinking across fiscal, but also wider, um, how you achieve the, the environmental objectives that you, you, that you want. Mm -hmm. Stuart wanted to ask a supplementary to that I, I, th I think we've opened up something quite wide and I just was looking for a concise view um, because this could be a academic dissertation taking four years almost all the references to tax here have been about using tax to influence behavior but of course the primary reason for tax is to raise income to spend on government objectives and I just wonder and, and then, of course, with the wider issue of uh, uh, using taxes to raise money for specific purposes. Uh, I am almost unique in not thinking that's a good idea, personally. Um, but how do, how do we draw the balance? Do we really think that taxes are the, are the best way of influencing behaviour? Or should we be looking at legislation? And I'm looking for a very, very high level uh, answer so that it is very concise. Anyone like to? Yes. If I may, I think when we're discussing which instrument might be best, there are certainly cases where regulation might be the better way of achieving an environmental goal, but there are also cases where an environmental tax is the most cost effective way of achieving a particular environmental goal. If you're targeting a very diffuse population, then an increase in price, even that's quite small, that can really nudge. Um, a change in behaviour. So that is then the most cost-effective option that is, um, that, that, that is available to, to the government. And one thing that I would say in the context of taxes being um, primarily used um, as a means of raising revenue, I think in the case of environmental taxes, that's not quite as simple as that, because what we are looking at is, at first, raising higher amounts of revenue and potentially over time, depending on the structure of the tax, that revenue may fall as behaviour changes. There are ways of combating that by introducing an escalator so the tax increases over time, for example. But as a general rule, the focus of an environmental tax in the first instance has to be its environmental purpose and the environmental aim of the tax itself. Given that the powers <coughs> that the Scottish Government has at its disposal right now, is there anything that strikes you as maybe being a potential that's maybe not been used to its fullest extent that, that might improve some environmental outcomes. Yes, Jenny. Um, thank you. you can be there. If we could advise on one single change to the way that this area is considered, we would say that rather than ministers and NGOs exhaustively going through every individual product or packaging type um, and proposing charges or bans or levies or deposits or phase out dates, um, we think it would be better to just require full producer responsibility for all products that are put onto the market and then producers have a responsibility of working out the most cost effective and efficient way to, to get those products back. I see. So that, that would put like the onus on, for example, a supermarket <coughs> to have the, the type of packaging that is easily recyclable. So the the onus is put on them. Yeah, so you can look at the example of Norway with deposit return systems where they actually introduced an environmental tax and they didn't uh, dictate that they had to have a deposit return system, but the drinks producers got together and realised that the most effective way for them to reclaim their bottles and cans was to implement a deposit return system. So they had to come up with that on their own, going from the principle that they were responsible for the full cost of reclaiming their products. Any other thoughts on that? I just reiterate that I think that producer responsibility is is those kind of schemes and those fiscal measures associated with that are are definitely I suppose the where we see the next progression in terms of trying to tackle some of the things like reducing the material uh, in terms of prevention uh, and design. So I would agree with with Jenny on that that there's more that we can do on that. We can go faster and further on producer responsibility as a way to actually make some serious changes. And the most obvious change that's going to make is a reduction in in source at source. 
you know, if, there, if there's a responsibility on them, they're going to try and eradicate all the unnecessary packaging. I, yeah. I think is, is it depends the, on the on the yeah. design of the scheme, and this is where it gets a bit more complicated because for each particular product, you you probably need to think really quite in depth about what the design of the scheme would be to give the right incentives to the producers to mm -hmm. optimise their material usage and make sure that the, the recycling at the end of the life is there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the scope of that would be very, very wide because it would be packaging, but it would also be design and through to retail, as you're saying. So I think it's a great principle. Um, it needs to be simpler than the current producer responsibility, easier to understand, and, and, and thinking through the consequences um, throughout the, way, the waste hierarchy that it doesn't have negative consequences, for example, for second-hand goods. We want them to be um, more attractive than, than you because that's still better for the environment um, in thinking that through. Could I, could I just add a kind of boring note of caution on this? I, I very much agree that extended producer responsibility is the right way to go if you can make it work in regulatory terms, but it's enormously challenging to design a scheme that's effective. Um, and in a sense, we've, um, you know, in looking at packaging so far, producer responsibility has focused on you know, the, most, the most easily um, manageable regulatory structure um, and going beyond that is going to be very challenging. I think getting back to Mr. Stevenson's question on you know, the, the purpose of all of this, um, I, I, one of the things you, we should be trying to do is introduce a, a kind of binary decision point into consumers' minds. So they make a, they make a choice um, at the point of purchase about whether, whether they need a plastic bag or whether they want to take a, a, a disposable cup with their, with their coffee. Um, and that's the best way of triggering a behavioural response. So it's not really so much about the revenue, it's about... Um, getting people to think about their, their patterns of consumption. Which could be quite difficult, though, when you go into a supermarket and, like, all the cucumbers are wrapped in plastic and you've got no option but to buy, you know, because there's no alternative to that. So is there a case of, like, you know, this more forward-thinking supermarkets need to be offering consumers that choice of not having, you know, for example, plastic at source when it really probably isn't completely necessary? Because you, there's only so many choices a consumer can make. You can opt to bring your own cup. You can opt to not to bring your own bag. But when it yeah. comes to actually buying produce, the apples are packaged the way the apples are packaged. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and one option using um, uh, particularly the, the, the electronic information that's available to supermarkets is uh, potentially giving uh, consumers a printout of the environmental impact of, of their, their basket of shopping at the end. So they might not actually be able to make, to make that choice at that point, but they'll be, they'll be made more aware of um, the packaging in, involved in their, their basket of shopping, potentially the carbon impact in, in their basket of shopping, and potentially then be able to pressure the supermarket for, for availability of more choices at a later date. But it's challenging. <coughs> Mark Ruskell. If I could just ju um, jump back to the, the bigger picture again, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion in Scotland, the UK, and the US about a Green New Deal and the kind of transformative changes that we need to put in place to tackle climate change. I'm just wondering if you've got a kind of a, a, a top sort of fiscal approach, a top tool for stimulating a Green New Deal in Scotland, and what, what would that be? Yes, um, I think... If we're really looking at the um, big potentials in the Scottish context, um, I read through the SPICE briefing, which is um, very interesting to have a look at exactly what Scotland has as potential areas for um, introducing new taxes. And I think one area where there could be a real raising of revenue with an environmental impact as well is to really look at the oil industry and to look at extraction. I think a carbon tax, like you could argue there would be um, distortions, but if you looked at the extraction level, and that's something that um, would be at least worth discussion for a Green New Deal um, kick-starting mechanism because you can see that that would have an impact on something that presumably in the medium term Scotland would like to move away from uh, in terms of its climate policy. And you can see that about 95% of oil production or 90% is actually in Scottish waters. So the, the economic distortions argument I think could be um, considerably less in that context if you were looking at taxing extraction of um, oil. Don't have the powers over that in the Scottish Parliament, I don't believe. That's at UK level. Am I wrong in thinking that? If I may, Camilla, I, th I think this gets us into the kind of usual territory yeah. that there's always a sideways 
way of getting at this because we have control over environmental rules yeah. that govern it. So therefore one can um, withhold environmental consents unless behaviours work in a particular way, even though one doesn't have the power. Mm. And that's often how we find we have to do things. It, it's why there's no, nu no nuclear power in Scotland. We don't have the power to forbid it, but we do provide the consent to build power stations. Yeah. And, uh, um, potentially like though as well. So oh, yes, sure. But, but, yeah. but, but uh -huh. it, it, like it. I mean, I'm sure um, Callum would, uh, would, would tell us how they <laughs> wrestle the system to make it deliver, even though we don't have the power. Just to go back, we touched on something that's uh, very much the, the headlines of the news. People want to do things, and it's hugely frustrating, as the convener touched on, when you go into a supermarket and you want to buy, for example, tomatoes, and they come in packages that are plastic, and some of them come in plastic trays or paper trays, and then you get loose tomatoes, and they're priced differently. So the ones within the plastic are priced so much a kilo. And when you go to buy the ones that are individually, they're priced per individual tomato. So it's, for the consumer, it's very difficult to look at the price and compare price with packaging. Or last night I went to buy a ready meal and it came in a foil tray with two plastic sachets inside and a cardboard outside. And it's, I want to be able to do it. It was really difficult to, to recycle that, and it's particularly difficult in Dumfries and Galloway when the recycling system is, 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 is so crazy. Um, so where should the, the, the weight, uh, the emphasis be? Should it be on consumers making consumer choices, which I think these examples I gave you uh, make it very difficult for consumers as they do their, their, their weekly shop to, to make those decisions. But it, should it be on levy? Should it be on tax? And, you, and you're talking about producer responsibility. The, 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 you know, it's the conditions are ripe, if you like, for people to uh, adopt these changes to, to uh, reduce their, their, their waste and whatever. So wh where should the weight be? I think the weight should be on the responsibility should lie with the producers to make an infrastructure and a shopping situation that's going to allow consumers to make the right choice because I absolutely agree it's really frustrating if you're trying to do the right thing but you can't because the options are not provided for you and I think DEFRA have just closed their consultation on extended producer responsibility which was carried out as you know uh, across all of the devolved administrations as well but am I right in thinking that if that doesn't turn out to be ambitious enough, then Scotland does actually have some powers to, to go beyond what they suggest with extended producer responsibility, despite it being really complicated. Uh, <laughs> yeah, convener, if I can answer um, both questions there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think the balance, um, there is a balance, and I think it's good to point out there is a balance because it does require the consumer as well to... Um, uh, to react and do make the right choices and sometimes those initial choices and enthusiasm can wane over time um, but also Jenny's point the producer has to um, step up and I think that's where we do need to see some ambition uh, and leadership at the highest level on uh, packaging reform which is the producer responsibility scheme that, that Jenny was mentioning um, so we do there is a risk um, the previous or the current packaging uh, which is a responsibility scheme we have at the moment, for example, only recovers around 10 to 15% of the costs that, that are actually out there that the producer should be paying for. So uh, we do need to see something that's more ambitious, but uh, I think we have to realise that it's more than just the producer. Um, the consumer, retailers, various others need to be involved, and that's why it's quite complex. Um, but if you get the right solution, it works very well. OK. Claudia Beamish. Convener, good morning to the panel. Could I go back to you, Jacqueline, and to anyone else who wanted to answer um, a little more detail on the question? Using um, the uh, carbon tax as, as an example, my understanding is that, um, and I'm not an economist, but the, that a tax goes to the, the state, to the revenue, um, uh, to be distributed as appropriate, um, and that a levy... Uh, if we use the example of the um, single-use bag levy, it goes actually to other, um, to local community groups or environment groups or whatever. 
um, and therefore it is possible, my understanding is, for us as a devolved administration to, to do those. Let's hope it is anyway, because we're doing some of them already. So it's really to ask you if you see any opportunity for, um, you, you highlighted the, the oil industry, to, to have some form of levy rather than tax in order to shift um, uh, opportunity into sustainable green um, uh, energy uh, projects and, and local economy projects? Um, thank you very much for, for this question. I think in terms of a levy and a tax, I'm not an expert on the Scottish system, but I, from, the, from the SPICE briefing, I think it's clear that a levy would be possible under current um, conditions. It also, um, there's also section 80B, clause 80B, which notes that there's a mechanism to add new devolved taxes of any description via an ordering council. So my question would be whether it would not be possible to consider um, introducing a new tax on um, expiration. I think there does seem to be potential there. And the discussion of um, distortions is one that could be met because the oil industry is, um, to 95% in, in Scottish waters. So I think there's a discussion to be had whether a tax wouldn't be possible. Um, but in terms of a levy, I think that's an interesting idea. And if those funds were to be used um, to invest in renewable energies, um, that could be a way of avoiding this discussion altogether and still um, raising revenues for a shift towards um, renewable energy in, in a Scottish context. Is there anyone else who wants to comment on, on that? You don't have to. <laughs> I, I, I would, um, again, counsel caution about, you know, this, this is a very real challenge for, uh, for Scotland, this, this distinction about what it has powers over and what it doesn't have powers over. The risk is that you, you end up um, designing instruments just in order to get, get around a set of rules and you end up with a suboptimal set of, uh, set of instruments. Um, so, um, you know, essentially... Um, the, as I understand it, the distinction between, between a levy and a tax is whether the, the money comes through to government or stays with the, um, uh, either the retailer or, or the industry uh, for, for recycling. Um, that's, that's not necessarily... You know, having, um, having the money staying with the industry um, and giving it choices over where it spends it is not necessarily the best way of, of, of spending money, which is essentially public money. <coughs> So, for example, the, um, uh, the landfill tax gave, um, uh, certainly, you know, my experience in England, gave um, landfill operators um, an opportunity to do quite a bit of advertising for themselves through local environmental schemes, which in many cases were, were good, but it wasn't necessarily the best use of that, that funding. So, you know, I, I recognise the challenge absolutely, but this is, you know, the levy route is not necessarily the best way of designing a, a, mm -hmm. an effective tax and, 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 mm -hmm. and spending system. Um, thank <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, convener. <coughs> um, can I just ask, take you back to behavioural change, please? And <coughs> how easy do you think it will be to, to sell to consumers um, the packaging reforms that you're talking about, which will essentially um, mean reduction in choice, um, because you know the, the packaging is there in most cases to increase shelf life. Um, it's not that uh, anybody in the industry wants to add additional cost. It's it's there for a reason. So, do you think um, that reduction in choice that would necessarily flow from what is being suggested will be an easy sell? You know, I would just um, uh, answer that question. I suppose um, the packaging reform, um, what you might see is from the initial sort of ambition that's been set out from uh, DEFRA at the UK level, is that the materials that are used in some of that packaging currently are either uh, composite materials or materials that are made of a plastic that's difficult to recycle. And a lot of the packaging reform will focus on actually making those materials easier to recycle better messages for consumers, um, making it easier for them to actually recycle it. So I'm not sure that choices will reduce. It might be the impact of those choices will be less in the environmental terms because the packaging reform has, has made some changes to the design or the way, way things are manufactured. 
Mm. Thanks. Yeah. If I could add to that, <coughs> I agree with what Callum said, and I think it will also help to improve the infrastructure to make it easier for people to recycle those items. So, for example, in Scotland at the moment, 43% of households don't have access to curbside recycling for glass. So the introduction of a deposit return system that includes glass is actually going to make it a lot easier for people to take their bottles back to be recycled. So um, it's not only, I suppose, about reducing... It won't necessarily reduce choice if customers want to have something that's packaged, but like Callum said, it will design it in so it's better and easier to recycle and the infrastructure will improve as well because producers will be putting money into setting up that infrastructure where the burden at the moment falls onto local council taxpayers. Right, OK. Um, can I just ask you about green fiscal reform and how would you define it and what are its principles and how should governments be strategically undertaking green fiscal reform? A blank canvas for you. A, a, a start on that. Um, uh, as an institute, we've done a fair amount of work on environmental tax reform across um, EU member states. I mean, I guess I, I would uh, say that it's a, it's a combination of um, an attempt to internalise the environmental uh, costs um, of decisions through um, the tax system. Uh, it's, to some extent, an, extent, an attempt to ensure that um, taxes are placed on polluting activities rather than um, uh, economically productive activities or socially useful activities. Um, and it's also an attempt to, to drive behavioural change. And you know, Knitting those, those three elements together as part of a, a, a wider package is essentially what in, environmental tax reform is about. And there's both a short-term and a long-term element to that. Um, uh, in the short term, you're trying to drive um, behavioural change. Um, in the long term, you're trying to shift your uh, the, the way your economy works to to a more sustainable uh, a more sustainable state with um, uh, you know, taxes on uh, the polluting activities, hopefully uh, reducing the level of those polluting activities um, and uh, shifting to a, a, a more environmentally sustainable um, overall tax base. The challenge often for finance ministries um, in all of this is, of course, that if you're successful in driving behaviour change. Um, you reduce your tax base. Um, and uh, in, my, in my previous existence as, a, as an environment official in London, um, I had a lot of conversations with colleagues in, in Treasury where they would point out to me that uh, they'd be very enthusiastic about um, an environmental tax scheme uh, in terms of securing environmental benefits, but they didn't like it at all in terms of the tax base because it, it meant that your tax base was overall less stable. So that is, that is a significant challenge for, for finance ministries in, in defining... Uh, uh, designing environmental tax reform that works. Mm -hmm. Yes. For me, green fiscal reform is trying to over would be trying to overcome some of the inherent problems with the um, it, the environmental agenda. It, it's hard to conceptualise. We throw out things like you know a two degrees rise in temperatures, ice caps melting. It's a long way away. Um, the timescales are, are are longer than any parliamentary cycle albeit we're, we're seeing increased urgency around that, we're welcoming the, the First Minister's um, uh, climate emergency. Um, but how do you take what is largely an abstract concept and make it tangible uh, for the consumer and for the producer when a lot of the environmental costs are paid a long way away from the point of production? Potentially, you know, plastic washing up on a beach the other side of the world uh, that was created here. Um, how do you internalise the cost of that uh, consequence so that the, 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 the uh, producer who creates the environmental cost is also financially um, has those consequences up front so that you then, um, a rational market would respond to that by um, reducing those costs because they're incentivised to do so. Um, as complicated as that is, I think that is at the heart of it. One half of that is consumer-focused and about changing behaviours and helping them understand that making a good choice here, that I totally agree with what was said uh, before about you know, bringing what is maybe passive, reactive behaviours to a conscious point of choice and therefore being nudged to make the right choice because there's a 20p charge on the bottle, a deposit. Um, and the other side is on the producer by 
by in, in improving the behaviours up front that will then flow through the, the life cycle of that, that project product. Yeah. Linda, yeah. Bring in Stuart, briefly. I, I just wanted to go back to Martin and what he's just said and test what he said. Is what Martin's saying that environmental taxes should actually be replaced by levies and the levy the fruits of those levies should therefore be applied to the environmental problems and not go near the Treasury, thus relieving the Treasury of the instability and the, the pressure downwards that is it, it properly associated with using levies in that way. And that taxes should therefore be on consumption, income and asset disposal rather than on activity uh, on instruments that are designed to change behaviours. In other words, behaviour change should be through levies and income generation for the state should be through taxes. Was that the essence of what you were saying? Uh, you asked me, uh, you asked us in a previous question for a short answer, so the short answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the slightly longer answer is that, um, you know, a levy is also, um, uh, it, it's, it's an instrument of um, generating revenue and applying that revenue to a public purpose. Um, that sort of thing is much, e much more easily managed within, uh, within government than outsourced to uh, the private sector through mechanisms to ensure that the, the income kind of avoids the, uh, uh, the tax and expenditure um, accounts. So if you've got a levy, you need a method by which public policy determines the, how the levy is spent. Absolutely. Thank you, Commissioner. John. Um, notwithstanding, um, Mr. Simpson, Mr. Mark, uh, I mean, what opportunities do you see for new taxes? What would your, or, or levies? I mean, and I speak as someone from a party that's fundamentally opposed to increasing burdens of taxation. Um, so, sorry, Stuart. Oh, thank you, Pat. Um, I mean, can you? Is there something? And therefore, one is driven towards the idea of, of levies, at least being of value to, to the industry to drive behavioural change. But what, what, where, where do you see possibilities in that regard? Uh, Are we thinking here specifically within within the Scottish powers? context? Yes, really. I would um, say. And within what yeah. we can do in Scotland, yeah, from I, my perspective, at any yeah. um, To be honest, I'm, I'm not enough of an expert on on um, you know what currently exists and what the flexibilities are in, in Scotland to be able to answer that question. But colleagues on the panel probably can. I, I was going to say um, one area that um, obviously we've mentioned producer responsibility a lot, and and that is that within the competence of the of um, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government, uh, although we choose uh, in many cases to be part of a UK wider um, scheme because often that's easier to manage, um, but it is within our competence. So we've, we've talked about that, but the other ones that are probably have been used quite effectively um, is uh, a minimum price. Um, so uh, we can look at that in terms of carrier bags, single use carrier bags. Um, and that's been quite successful. It's a small charge that, uh, for a carry bag that's made a, a significant difference. And there are other areas where that could be applied. I know that the expert panel on um, charges and other measures is, is recently consulted on um, should there be a similar approach to coffee cups in terms of a, a, a minimum price um, displayed within the... the, the the charge for coffee. So those are things that are um, relatively easy for, for well, not easy because nothing is easy. It's always, always complex to look at the research behind these things. But in terms of actually applying it, it's easier than an actual full tax. Um, so it works in areas where you would like the charge to be retained by the retailer or, or, or the producer. Um, so that, that, that works well. Um, the other area, I suppose, of, of influences we have uh, the plastics tax which has been proposed at the uk level for packaging plastics packaging and while that's that's within the uk competence um i think we should be trying to influence that as much as possible to be as 
um, helpful as possible to create recycling markets and to drive the change in design, etc. And it would be useful for that, coming back to one of the earlier questions about what you would ask for, uh, it would be useful for that if it was broader than just plastics and it looked at other packaging or even plastics outside the packaging sphere. But that is particularly within the, the UK competence, but obviously devolved nations are contributing into that. Thanks so much. Okay. I was just, can I add to that that we agree that the tax they should be looking at all materials rather than just plastic, and that should include biodegradable and compostable items because they're they can be unexpectedly problematic, um, in, in terms of you know we don't have the infrastructure or the information for people to know how to do the right thing with them, um, and they also take up a lot of land use to grow the resources that we need to make them. So we're not really moving away from the single use problem when when we replace uh, coffee cups with compostable items. But what I really wanted to say was um, you can also look at applying the deposit mechanism to other items as well as uh, bottles and cans. So, uh, for example, in Germany, there's a, a system called the Recup programme. And I think it's in Cologne, 2,400 different outlets have signed up to it and people pay a one euro deposit to get a reusable coffee cup. And you can get it from one cafe, use it and then take it back to another cafe that's participating. And uh, they've had really a lot of um, interest from it in a short space of time. And I'd be happy to find some information about that to, write, to send to you in writing later. Thank you. Okay. And Carson. Obviously, to, to shape future policy, we, we need to look back to see how uh, other levies and taxes have worked and, and learn uh, the lessons from them. So is there any specific lessons that can be learned from um, uh, the Scottish landfill tax and the, the carrier bag levy that we need to uh, recognise moving forward with new levies or taxes? Uh, I would just say that... Um, from a perspective of looking at success, the, the landfill tax um, has been very successful as a kind of push mechanism to get material out of, out of landfill. And looking back over the last 10 years, you can see in Scotland, it's really helped drive, it's been part of the package that's really helped drive increased recycling rates, getting us up into the, to the mid 40s. Um, and obviously, uh, anything to do with recycling and the circular economy has also a big impact on climate change. So it's really helped contribute to that. And I think going back to what Martin um, said earlier, uh, one of the challenges with with uh, the environmental taxes is is the fact that you're trying to change behaviour, and then so then the revenue declines. But with the landfill tax, we we had an escalator that was in there from the start, and businesses and the industry knew what it was, and they could predict over the years what the price would be. Um, so that has allowed the revenue to be more stable, but at the same time has allowed business to prepare um, and has increased the incentive over time. So it could be that there are other examples where we would apply that kind of thinking um, because it has proved successful uh, in terms of the landfill tax, you know, using an escalator and giving some certainty to the future price of the tax. I, I, agree, I agree with that. The, um uh, both those initi uh, initiatives you mentioned have been um, successful overall and we've seen positive effect on the ground from them. Um, I think one lesson to learn in terms of fine-tuning such initiatives going forward is to think through the possible knock-on implications further up the waste hierarchy. So an, uh, an obvious example, the landfill tax is there to discourage landfill. Um, right at the, the worst thing you can do with things is just bury them back in the ground. Um, but we don't want to see negative consequences up the, up the waste hierarchy. And one small example that, that has been seen um, with the landfill tax is that um, as the cost of putting things into landfill goes up, um, the Charity Retail Association have done some research that shows about 30% of charity shops in, in Scotland are charged for their waste. And when they're saving about 99% of books from landfill, about 92% of media, about 95% of textiles. They are taking household waste and, and diverting um, a huge amount of that from going to landfill. But there's a small proportion that they can't divert. And with that, if they're being charged for that waste, um, then that can have a consequence of actually discouraging them from taking a donation. 
uh, they've got to think twice um, about taking that donation. So um, the landfill tax is definitely a good thing, but we would want there to be absolute clarity in how such things are worded to, to, to ensure that reuse or repair, you know, these higher value waste hierarchy activities are, are consistently encouraged. Um, and that's potentially one side effect of a levy over a tax, just to sort of digress into that, is that if a levy, it, if there is some middle ground between obviously a tax where the, the, the government have complete control on, on how they spend it and a levy where it's, it's you know, there's sort of, with carrier bags a voluntary arrangement that retailers give that to good causes and, and, and many do. Um, if there could be some influence over it, we would encourage that environmental levies um, are, are encouraged, supported, required, uh, depending on the, the level of, uh, to go into environmental benefits, because we then believe you'd have a compounding effect, um, as well as changing the, the consumer behaviour and the producer behaviour, that money invested could make a significant difference. Um, yeah, well, that, you, you preempted my next question, and that was very much, if, if, if we're in agreement that the, the taxes and the levies we have uh, have returned uh, positive policy outcomes, has the use of the revenue uh, that those have generated have been maximised because, you know, we've got the Landfill Communities Fund and the, the voluntary arrangements for the, the carrier bags. How, how can we maximise that revenue? Maybe some of the other panel could answer that. Is, are, are we maximising the revenue we get from these schemes at the moment? Is there more that can be done rather than them going into voluntary charitable organisations or whatever? Maximising the impact of, yes. of, of the revenue. Yeah, I, um, again, um, with apologies, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on what happens in Scotland, but one mechanism that you could use for that, which potentially simplifies things from the business's point of view, is, um, and this is you know, arguably a slightly crude way of getting around the, the levy distinction, but you could, uh, you could set up a, a mechanism um, at government level into which um, the levy um, collectors, so the businesses, could contribute their, their funding, and that then enables you to, to channel and direct that towards um, projects of, of, of genuine public priority rather than um, just um, you know, projects which look good in PR terms from the, the point of view of the levy collectors. And you know, one, of the, one of the concerns I think I have on, on, uh, on levy mechanisms is that you're introducing quite a lot of complexity for the businesses um, collecting the levy and then, then having to distribute it, which is not really part of their core business, if they can then kind of pass that back to government voluntarily, it might be a more effective mechanism from their point of view. Okay. So when, when we're talking about the performance of environmental taxes or charges, for those operating at a UK level, is there an argument that uh, for further environmental taxes and levies to be devolved to the Scottish uh, Parliament, Scottish Government? Is there any examples at a UK level? Did, uh, well, just is, is, there, is there any case when it comes to the performance of that tax or the levy yeah. that there should be more devolved from the UK down to, to the Scottish Government? I suppose we're looking at the deposit returns or the carrier bags or, or, or whatever. I'm just going to say, there, I mean, in terms of the carrier bag minimum charge, uh, deposit return and other producer responsibility schemes, they are they are devolved, so, as I understand it. Uh, we do have the powers to do that. Um, sometimes, though, we choose, we look at something like packaging, which in a UK context is very complex uh, uh, across the UK. So it makes sense in that case to try and work within the UK um, scheme. I think the challenge is where maybe the ambitions of Scottish ministers are, are, are not the same as the ambitions of UK ministers and so that, that can be um, a challenge if, if the scheme is not as ambitious as we'd like to see in Scotland. Um, but I think the, the one that I mentioned before um, in relation to uh, the proposed um, plastics tax is one where um, it would be really nice to see an ambitious um, scheme there that is it's a bit um, more than the proposals are at the moment um, to go faster and further, if you like. But obviously that's an, not an area that we, that we currently have confidence in. We, we can influence it. 
we would think that it would make more sense for the devolved institu uh, institutions to have a proper free hand here unless a particular measure has a demonstrable negative impact on the rest of the UK. Um, it would mean that you had a, an easier option between taxes and levies and then were there, therefore able to apply the most appropriate one and not just the one that was easiest in terms of uh, powers. I'd, I'd just add that you know, as, a, as a kind of um, sunny-minded optimist on this, I, I, I like to imagine uh, the possibility of virtuous competition between the different parts of the UK in the level of ambition that they set for, for uh, environmental um, taxes and, and, and levies and um, the, uh, the use to which those revenues can be put. Um, and to some extent that has very much operated with the, uh, the, the plastic bag levy, which was, of course, first introduced um, in, in Ireland and then... Um, uh, demonstrated its, its, its effectiveness and was, was taken up more broadly. I've got questions from Mark Ruskell. Yeah, um, Jenny and Callum, I think you've already mentioned about the expert panel on environmental charges um, and your involvement in that. I'm not sure if any of the other panel have been involved in that, in that group either. Um, do you have any, any more thoughts on the remit of that group, on what you expect to come out of it? Um, one thing which we would love to see is to have an NGO representative on that group because from what I understand there are academics and some experts from industry and there's somebody from the Climate 2050 group but I think it would also be a really valuable contribution to add somebody from an environmental NGO. Um, and then just more broadly we'd love to see a top-down approach that's driven by this principle of full producer responsibility rather than... Um, going item by item, mm -hmm. I think it would uh, be able to make more bigger change happen quicker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, the, um, uh, the, 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 the the panel recently had stakeholder events uh, at the beginning of May, uh, which Jenny and I both attended, which were um, looking at a package of measures around coffee cups. So uh, in that package, there was a, a, the looking at whether uh, a minimum charge um, I, based on separating out, separating out the cost of the coffee cup from the, from the, um, the coffee uh, would be one option. Looking at reuse schemes, which I think Jenny already mentioned, uh, that are already operating in other countries, and whether that would help um, change behaviour to more uh, a reuse coffee cup rather than a disposable one. Um, so there was a range of measures there that the, the panel were consulting on and were looking for, for input. So, uh, and I believe that they will, their role is to recommend to, to um, Scottish Government ministers their thoughts, and I'm sure they're working on that soon based on the output from those events. Um, the next thing that they are looking at, I understand, is to look at the, um, the range of plastic items under the single-use plastics directive that the EU has um, brought forward. So there's a range of materials in there from uh, things like straws and uh, plastic cutlery and various other plastic products that the EU has targeted either for a ban or for some serious reduction measures. It includes things like fishing nets, for example. So uh, my understanding is the panel is looking at that next. And so that's the kind of thing that we would expect them to um, be making recommendations on after after um, disposal of coffee cups. Yeah, so it's taking a, a lead partly from the directive. Are there any other sort of expert working groups at UK or international level that are feeding into this agenda of how we how we deal with plastic waste? Uh, there, there's also um, uh, the UK Plastics Pact. So there's there's a there's a group um, which is looking at. Uh, driven, I suppose, by um, uh, our initial work by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, looking at the impact of plastics globally. Um, and there's a RAP in, um, in England has um, been a facilitator of setting up this um, pact, which is really looking at trying to, a range of things, uh, objectives around plastics, but reducing their impact overall, increasing the recyclability, uh, removing non-recyclable plastics from the supply chain, etc. Um, so that that work is just sort of um, underway. Um, so that there's a group that's orientated around that. 
There's also a lot of expertise um, amongst environmental NGOs and I was part of a group who responded uh, as UK-wide link, so it included Scottish Environment Link but also the link organisations from England and Wales and they've written really in-depth informative responses to the consultations that came out from DEFRA recently and it's, it makes for really helpful reading, there's a lot of information in there. If I may, I would just like to second that point. I think it would be really important for the, um, for the expert panel to also include civil society voices because there's a lot of work in Scotland that's, I think, being overlooked because there's not that representation on the panel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, John? Um, can I just throw in something a bit tangential, but um, environmental nonetheless, I mean, we're talking about... Re and this refers to a programme I heard on Radio 4 last night when I was driving through, about the need to maintain infrastructure. And at the moment we're talking about reduce, recycle and reuse. But maintain is not um, part of that um, at the moment. And could I just have your views on that, uh, critical infrastructure, which if it's not maintained in an engineering way, um, so often deteriorates to the point of needing to replacement. Um, and in terms of behavioural change, there needs to be a, perhaps an enhanced, um, an enhanced view towards maintaining what we have. Um, is it something that any of you would like to comment on? I just, it just suddenly seemed to me like a very important thing that we hadn't actually thought of <laughs> focusing, dear ones, say, on coffee cups and plastic bottles, rightly so. But there is actually also other things we should be focusing on in terms of behavioural change. Yeah. To, to keep with the R's, the three R's, repair is, is the fourth R, um, and that's the best thing you can do something is, is to repair it and keep it in use, not, yes. not replace it with something new that's got all the carbon footprint with that. Um, and the right to repair, I mean, not on the critical infrastructure side, although that's clearly imp important, but just for consumer products and, and having repair built into design so that repairability, it's, it's easy to, you know, if your complex thing breaks, to get the one little piece you need to keep it going for another five years. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of um, good initiatives coming out of Scandinavia, for example, in relation to, to right to repair and making that the mainstream activity. You don't uh, repair as the... The last resort is the first thing you do and is the environmentally responsible thing to do. But at the moment it's quite difficult, isn't it, Louise? You talked about, like, say, charity shops or certain items that they can't take, you know, anything to do with electrical items. They can't be passed on. And anything like that that breaks down, the first thing people do is actually just, you know, a lot of the components are sealed, for example. You can't get into them, you use special tools or whatever. So what do you see happening that could change that kind of culture from that point of view go with a very small example but just highlight a great example in my own town of sterling that um, uh, transition sterling run a, a repair cafe you can take anything in and they'll work with you to fix it and if you've not got the time to attend it they'll for a very small hourly charge will try and fix it for you so you know tool libraries are springing up uh, in the main cities and are offering those opportunities to, to do repair and i think that's part of the way forward I mean, I, I think Mr. Scott was, was principally thinking about um, kind of large-scale infrastructure. Um, uh, Which wasn't yeah. necessarily designed for maintenance, yeah. and that's what became yeah. a problem. And I think, you know, this morning we've been very focused on um, product and, and the consumer level, but I think the, the, the environmental tax picture is also relevant to the big infrastructure um, choices. And I think, um, you know... Uh, long-term planning for infrastructure, um, in particular to ensure that infrastructure is, is, is resilient to the impacts of climate change, is obviously a very important priority for, um, for governments across um, the EU. But you can also um, uh, drive some of the right investment decisions by providing long-term clarity about um, carbon prices, about environmental taxes more generally, thereby giving um, industry clarity on what sorts of investment in infrastructure will be uh, sustainable in the long term and what sort of th sorts of investment will not be. Um, and that, that element of, of removing uncertainty through your long-term tax um, system uh, is, is one of the most important ways in which you can drive a private sector response to the sorts of investment that you, you need in, in decarbonising the economy. So I think, I think it is, it's a very relevant question for, for environmental taxation, but perhaps slightly outside the, the producer responsibility um, product and con consum consumer level that we've been, been looking at this morning. 
But perhaps yes, there's space you. for that wider picture within the circular economy and zero waste bill, which has been promised for this parliamentary session. And, you know, hopefully that will go beyond what we've been focusing on this morning and look at the bigger picture as well to address it holistically. Yes. Um, I, I suppose on two, two sides, I would agree with, with uh, Martin about um, on the big infrastructure, we certainly need to get the carbon price right. Uh, and, and that's a question. Um, we do have um, a process for that, but I suppose the question is, are we are we getting that right now with knowing what we know now? Um, but that will certainly influence a lot of our investment decisions on big infrastructure and, and enhance the opportunities for repair and maintenance over other options. But I think uh, getting back to the more con consumer level, the two things that could really change the repairability uh, is one, um, what we do with public procurement because we can actually request things through public procurement and make a big influence on the market and we spend billions every year we should be using that to optimize repair maintenance and reuse and the other thing is in the design of what we've already talked about producer responsibility schemes uh, if they're applying to durable items like electronics there should be some criteria in those schemes that incentivizes repair and maintenance and design of that within the the producers and uh, manufacturing process. Yeah. Um, I agree with everything that's been said here and just to build on that in particular about what Martin said about um, creating long-term stability and policy and encouraging private investment. One thing that we haven't really discussed this morning um, in, in depth is the definition of environmental fiscal reform which goes further than just talking about taxes but also looking at um, expenditure, looking at subsidies that are in existence within um, a government's budget, looking at the tax exemptions, tax reductions. And there's a great deal of potential there, I think, to raise um, additional revenues, to free up revenues that at the moment are incentivising environmentally undesirable behaviours in, in the UK or in the Scottish context as well. And these are the kinds of revenues that also can be used to um, cover these kind of infrastructure repairs that we deem necessary within the... Um, within the economy. So something that, yeah, we haven't, we haven't discussed is the amount of money that flows um, into North Sea oil exploration. That's subsidies from UK level, but these are, these are all factors to be taken into account when we are screening for environmental tax policies to be thinking about what's the government spending on as well? What are the incentives that the government perhaps inadvertently um, put in place, or they were put in place for a different reason and over time, um, that, that, that purpose has simply been lost. What, what is that spending and how can we reform that to better drive the economy onto a more sustainable path and to drive, to drive investment as well onto a more sustainable path? So I think that's a really important thing to consider in this context. Thank okay. you. Okay. What um, potential is there to, to turn uh, culture to, to more providing services rather than buying goods? So for example, this building here, there's tens of thousands of light bulbs. So rather than the Scottish Parliament uh, buy lots of light bulbs, they buy a, a service and it's light, and, they, and they, they contract with the company to provide light. Is there, is there a potential to incentivise um, consumers to do that with washing machines or tumble dryers, whatever? You know, for example, John was talking about the, the cost of maintaining and repairing. I've got a, a tumble dryer, it's 140 pounds. There's a little component that costs about 50 pence, it needs replaced. I'm gonna buy a new tumble dryer because I don't know how much the service engineer is gonna charge me for a call out in a rural area and so on. And, and, and those are the sort of things that consumers have got to take in consideration. So is, is there potential for services to be sold rather than goods? So I buy a, a, a clothes dryer service from a company and I don't actually own the tumble dryer, a bit like, Cars, I don't want to buy my own car, but I need, I need to get from A to B, so I buy a service that gets me from A to B. Is that something that could be thought about in the future? Have you thought about a washing line? <laughs> so, have you thought about a washing line? <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, yes. It's very much in use at the moment. <laughs> um, I, I was just going to say, I, I suppose Zero Waste Scotland has a lot of experience in that. We have a programme where we support businesses make a change to their business model where they move from selling assets to transformationally going to something that's more circular, which is a lease or a rental model. Um, and there are actually quite a lot of challenges. It's not right for everything. Um, 
but it, it certainly can work uh, more in the digital age as well when we've got better access to information. But there are some challenges around liabilities, uh, how, how assets appear in, in company balance sheets and how their cash flow works uh, and insurance. So it, it's really, a, I suppose, a case by case and there's some pioneering work. There are companies in Scotland that now rent um, LED lighting and provide that service. But from the, say, the Parliament's um, uh, position, then they have to adapt to that change and it might mean that they have a different contractual arrangement, they have to have different expertise in their staff or whatever. So uh, it is certainly the way to go, um, sometimes called servitisation, um, but it's kind of pioneering in different areas at different speeds, depending on how easy it is for that area to move to a kind of more of a uh, leasing or rental approach. Just to add on that, I, I think um, it, it's, it's one of those areas where you want to see um, innovation in the private sector and the creation of these, these schemes. It's quite difficult to do that, to direct that in a top-down way from, uh, from a government perspective. What you can do um, is when those schemes and when those services become apparent, you can, you can make sure that you're, you're addressing um, all of the handicaps that might be in their way or the little um, regulatory challenges that might be in their way. And, and there are some cases where um, you, can, you can adapt your levies and charges to, to encourage those schemes. So, for example, um, the congestion charge in London is not applied to um, car share um, uh, systems. Um, and that is, that is one mechanism that drives down the cost of those, uh, those systems for, for consumers. Um, and also the fact that you can't park a car in London anyway is quite, a, quite an important incentive. But, you know, it, it's, it's one way of ensuring that that sort of scheme can be encouraged and given an additional boost once it's, once it's on the ground and once it's been set up by the private sector. Claudia Beamish. Thanks, Kavita. We, we've um, uh, listened to quite a few um, of, of you have highlighted um, new action already. Uh, can I focus our minds further on that? And uh, I'd like you as a panel to um, explore with us the priority areas for action whether are the best opportunities for environmental fiscal um, uh, reform. And while we're doing this, we've talked about infrastructure and new infrastructure. We haven't talked about the implication for um, those working in present industries, um, and uh, which, of course, um, uh, is, is very important, and, and how that shift can be supported uh, um, through a just transition. And, uh, um, so that would be useful. And if we could start with the circular economy and waste, and we have touched on some of this, but um, plastics, textiles, um, uh, and uh, very demanding problem waste streams. Um, and I'll just highlight something very quickly in relation. It's not textiles, but it's more furniture. I was looking, I won't say which site it was, but one of the sites where you can buy um, used furniture. And I was thinking, why are all these wonderful corner sofas that are only three or four years old being sold by um, people? It's great to be able to buy them. It's great they're not being dumped in landfill or, or whatever, but it um, looks great to me, and one might say there's a small stain on, on, on an arm of it or something. I mean, how do we, in addressing this, it's partly about the tax and levies, but also partly about um, our behaviour as consumers, and I... And I I, you know, I, I put myself in, in, in that as well. I face challenges. So um, if we could think about the circular economy and, uh, and those areas first, and then we'll move on to um, the broader climate change mitigation issues. I just have one very quick comment, which is um, I'm not actually sure what's happening in terms of training people and do we have modern apprenticeships which are really encouraging people to learn repair skills because it feels to me like we're maybe losing a generation of people who have these repair skills and if we could really teach our young people these skills then that would help uh, with the repair economy and it could also help to breathe life into some of Scotland's more rural areas where people are moving away from. Um, so that's, that's all I have to say on that. Yes, Michael. One, one message which I think a few of the panel have hinted at, and I, I, I would make, is, is broadening out the discussion beyond plastic. There are lots of hard to recycle materials, mattresses, tires, bike tires, carpets. These are all things that there is no um, good option to recycle in Scotland or any option at all. Um, I think the other point would just be around 
um, thinking more holistically around what we're what we're trying to, to achieve and making sure that you know if something's broken it can get fixed if something you know if you if you are getting rid of a sofa it can be reused these are all better things than than, land, than landfill <clears throat> excuse me so all better things than landfill and how do we make sure they, they are happening as as the first choice really and how that gets more mainstreamed and, and, and I think, uh, echoing what Callum said, pro public procurement has a point, a role to play in that. Um, it is more complicated and it does take time, but uh, if reuse is not an option in the public procurement, why, why would the individual do it? Um, there's an initiative we've been doing for the last two years, which is a reuse consortium. It's a national um, contract with, with Scotland Excel to provide reuse furniture to local authorities. And uh, so far, Fife and Aberdeen City and Renfrewshire are, are as local authorities are actually buying reuse furniture so that lovely sofa that you saw in in that shop you know that is an option for for local authorities to buy on a national contract and we would love to see more initiatives like that that is public procurement buying reuse that's how behavior will change anyone else yes i think one thing that's very important if we're thinking about how to realize um, a circular economy is thinking about how to enable um, repair to take place and part of that is that labor probably needs to become at the bottom end of the income scale to become cheaper so it's more feasible for um, employment to um, fill this gap as well so green budget europe for example did a study on um, developing a roadmap for circular economy in the context of finland and we looked at the kind of taxes that could be implemented that would start to drive that change um, on the part of industry things like carbon taxes fossil fuel subsidy reform um, electricity taxes as well, and using um, a proportion of those revenues to reduce um, labour costs at the bottom end of the, of the labour scale so that you create as well um, more possibilities for um, repair to be part of the economy. Because as, it, as, as things are now, it's, as we all know, it's, it's very expensive to get something repaired. It is cheaper to go out and, and buy, a new, buy a new sofa on, on many occasions. So thinking about how to reduce the labour costs, I think, is also an important element within the circular economy. Right, and could, could I um, move our discussion to um, climate change mitigation, including any views on how the Scottish Government should use powers over air departure tax, assuming issues are resolved, enabling the tax to be devolved, and also um, uh, in relation to natural resources, um, peat and food chain supplies, forestry and, and pesticides. I was going to say even pesticides, but it, only because we don't seem to be talking about um, a, a tax, we're looking more at a ban. But if we think about taxes at this, at this point, any comments on any of that from the panel? I put it all together just in case people want to comment on some of it and not other bits, and you don't have to comment on all of it. Uh, I was just going to, uh, I suppose, make the point that um, a lot of the measures that are around circular economy, so the things that we've already been discussing about um, procurement, producer responsibility, landfill tax, etc., all those things have a very big impact on on carbon. So, uh, in effect, they are taking, they are kind of um, addressing the carbon issue, although they're not effectively a, um, a form of a carbon tax. But all those measures are. Um, really driving towards a circular economy and the circular economy and material use in our in our economy is one of the biggest elements of our emissions. So so that's, I suppose, I'm, I'm kind of making the point that those things um, would um, would make a significant contribution to, to the climate change agenda. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, after you. Um, on the question of the air departure tax, I think at least one lesson that we see from that, if the rate does diverge from the air passenger duty, um, I think there's very important equity considerations that have not really been taken sufficiently into account. We can see that it's, it really is the richest income, the wealthiest income deciles that use flights the most. So you're, advan you're giving an advantage um, and a tax benefit in essence to the um, richest 20% um, of the population in Scotland, which I think is, is something that can be carried on to other areas. I think it's very important also when we're implementing environmental taxes to look at 
not only the climate change impact, which I think is relatively clear if the tax is reduced, but also to be thinking about the equity impacts. So I think that's a very important aspect of this tax, which perhaps has not been taken sufficiently into account in the proposed reform of um, the air departure tax. Yeah. Um, part, of, part of my brain is telling me that the air departure tax is a, is a controversial issue and I shouldn't touch it. And the rest of my brain is telling me that it's a controversial issue and I should touch it. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to go with the, the fun part, um, uh, which is that, you know, um, Air taxation tends to be characterised by, by serious political timidity across um, developed economies. And I think it's largely because um, it has an impact on people who have um, political agency and a political voice and can influence um, decision makers more easily. Um, there are very serious issues, um, obviously, uh, for um, isolated communities which depend on air travel or where um, uh, air travel is... Um, the cheapest and simplest uh, choice for um, those travelling long, long distances. And that's clearly a very important issue for, for Scotland to address. But I think one of the, um, one of the things that uh, was one of the drivers of the Gilets Jaunes protests in France um, on you know, the introduction of uh, carbon pricing for uh, the kind of transport that poorer people tended to use was that um, they could see that... Um, similar mechanisms were not being applied to, to air transport and, and to, uh, to air travel, the kind of transport that richer people use. Mm. So there's, there's a very significant social equity um, challenge here. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it's easy for think tanks to say, to say this, but I, I would love to see um, political decision makers um, being uh, bolder on this issue and saying, uh, you know, there are significant carbon costs to flying. Um, those carbon costs need to be addressed in the same way that we are, we are addressing carbon costs throughout the rest of the economy and arguably need to be addressed more as a priority because the people tending to pay those, um, those, those costs will tend to be wealthier. Thank you. Claudia, can I bring in Stuart now? Yes, yeah. yes. I, 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 I'm, I'm really keen to know if there's anything about the other issues I've raised, uh, on, particularly on peat and, and, and those areas. Just, just to say that there are examples of, of levies on peat extraction and taxes on pesticide use and fertilizer use, and I, I can um, send um, details of that to, um, to the, uh, the, the clerks if that's helpful. Yes, that right, would be thank helpful. You. Thank you. Stuart. Uh, thank you. Maybe just on aviation, it's unique, I think. Uh, it's the only mode of transport that gets its fuel tax free, uh, apart from the small uh, petrol driven aircraft that service our Northern Isles and Western Isles, uh, who do have to pay tax, curiously enough. Um, we've also some things we could do ourselves. I mean, this Parliament wanted to take away my perfectly functioning laptop PC and give me a new one, which I refused to allow them to do. So it's, it's now uh, seven years old, um, and when it runs out of steam, I will replace Windows with Unix, which I carry on my keyring for anybody who needs it for their old PC. And I have a 20-year-old PC I'm still using. We can all do that. Um, but, um, I, and again, I want to talk about uh, taxes and levies a bit, um, but just make the observation, Callum made one or two points about uh, whose balance sheet assets appear on. The, the introduction of the IFRS to replace FRS 17 standard for accounting I'm not an accountant, um, did create contingent assets so that you now get things that will appear sometimes on two balance sheets, um, which is interesting, but they no longer disappear as they used to under FRS 17. And finally, the UK tax clause is the most complex in the world with 32,000 pages. Uh, and it was a quarter of that only 20 years ago. And if we don't do something about that, we're really just going to keep finding corners to hide in uh, for environmental polluting. Right, now, um, the, 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 quite a lot of what I might have asked has been covered, Kamina, so I won't. But there are a couple of things. A couple of things. Um, cost of administration and revenue potential is something that treasuries generally uh, will look at. And of the available options we've got in this policy area, um, is there evidence that we're being driven by that or are we being driven by environmental considerations? Because there will be some environmental taxes 
that in effect deliver no financial benefit because the cost of collecting is similar to the cost of, of taking them away. Are the, can we be doing better there so that there, there is more incentive to develop environmental taxes, levies or charges? Anyone in the panel like to? Next question. Right. I'll, I'll, yes. I'll venture an answer. Um, I, uh, I suppose from my experience in producer responsibility schemes that I see, um, I think the, it's very much about um, trying to, from what we've seen so far, it's very much about cha changing the way the materials are either manufactured, how they're collected for recycling or reuse or everything. So I think that is, um, I would say that the environmental focus is, is, is the prime focus in there. Um, uh, but I've got no experience of the, the, other, the other taxes, so I, I can't really comment on them. Did you want to come in? Mike Roscoe. You had that. Sorry, was, I think she was No problem. I've just come in very quickly um, on the question of administration costs. Um, I think one thing that policymakers can try to do is design a tax in a way which means it links to existing collection mechanisms. So if there's already a tax collection mechanism in place, then the environmental tax can be added on to that. And then the administration costs are very, very small. Of course, that isn't always um, possible, but in many cases, that's how environmental taxes have been implemented in the past. Okay. Quite small bit before I conclude. Yeah. Um, we've referred earlier to a hypothecation, uh, essentially raising a tax which will then, because it's raised, be spent in a particular area. Is that something which uh, helps a public acceptability of new taxes taking John Scott's view that new, people who introduce new taxes are rarely popular. Is hypothecation uh, a good thing to use because it makes acceptability greater? The short answer is it can indeed help quite considerably with um, public acceptability. It depends very much so on the environmental tax. If that's going to raise a large amount of revenue, hypothecation is not going to be the most desirable um, way of using that revenue. It's better then to bring large amounts of revenue into the general budget and then make decisions based on the government's fiscal priority policies for that year. But as a in terms of um, acceptance, using a proportion of revenues in that way can be um, a helpful means while giving the government the freedom to use the rest of the revenues as it sees fit. And also just a very quick addition, I think that, that needs to be based on, as far as possible, it needs to be based on a stakeholder discussion about what is the best way of, of using that revenue. And if you can demonstrate that political process, it can be a significant help to, to acceptance. Okay, short question from Matt Ruskell. Yeah, can I go back to the waste issues and the amount of residual waste that we have in Scotland? I mean, you know, we're, we're making good progress on deposit return scheme now and some good progress on recycling rates as well, but there's still this, you know, amount of residual waste, particularly single-use um, uh, plastic items and, and other very hard, hard to recycle, um, hard to treat uh, residual waste streams that are still there. Um, I mean, a particular concern, you, you mentioned about um, low-income communities, a particular concern, a number of communities in my region um, who are low-income, is the growth of incineration and the growth of proposed incinerators around Scotland. Uh, we're seeing a lot of speculative applica applications coming in uh, from developers. There doesn't seem to be a, a sense of how much incineration we may need in Scotland. Uh, particularly given the, the ban on um, you know, food waste going, going to landfill and, and some of the pressures there. And COSA have raised a number of concerns about the capacity that we have to deal with the residual waste in Scotland, even though we're going to have schemes like DRS and everything else kicking in. So uh, what are your thoughts on, on incineration? And we took some evidence at an earlier session where um, we understand that there's some work looking at an incineration tax going on at the UK level. It's something the Scottish government is not looking into at this point. But is there is there an issue here that the more that we that we move towards banning landfill and taxing landfill, that inevitably we get to a point where incineration will look like an easy option that could lock in um, incineration for a, for a long period of time? Pitchin. Um. Yeah, I, mean, I think that is a concern we've seen in, in northern European countries that they, with large incineration capacity, 
um, that they, uh, they end up in a situation where uh, it's harder to recycle because of that capacity that's already sitting there in terms of <coughs> infrastructure. So I think, yeah, it would be much more, um, I suppose what we don't want to fall into the trap of is having an incineration uh, energy from waste uh, infrastructure that is too big, um, that is, um, is oversized and would prevent further recycling. And I think what the landfill tax is, is very much a kind of push measure. It's trying to push um, material out of landfill. Um, and I suppose what we are looking at now is saying, well, actually the answer is to lie further up the waste hierarchy and like trying to prevent these materials from um, in, uh, getting, getting into landfill or in any different waste at the end of their life. Um, require some interventions at the top of the waste hierarchy. So that might be, for example, banning the item uh, or bringing in something that's producer responsibility around that item that means it goes into recycling infrastructure. Um, so I think uh, that's where probably the measures are actually moving now rather than, than uh, sort of sitting in that um, kind of uh, relying on pushing things out of one particular treatment technology. Mm -hmm. okay, I uh, think Martin has a bit of a wanting to come yeah. in. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry, I was just actively <laughs> thinking. You, you look, you look like you okay. Can uh, I just get a view, though, on incineration tax? I mean, is this something Mark, that's been put to us? one question. We are actually running out of time. It we have a number of members want to actually ask other questions. interested to know if, if the panel think that's a good idea or not. It might not be. Um, can I can I come to Claudia Beamish? Because Claudia, you wanted to pick on something else was, before I go, and I want to give enough time to Angus Macdonald to ask the questions that he wants to ask. So, Claudia, right. could you ask um, your question, please? Uh, yes, particularly for for Jenny, I was going to ask about the the lessons that have been learnt during the design of the deposit return scheme and how these can be built on to progress the circular economy and producer responsibility. And more widely, I'd like to ask the panel very briefly, please. Um, the opportunities to use tax or levies to mitigate exported environmental impacts, for example, international impacts on food, forestry or other products. Thank you. I think one of the key lessons that we've learned is that there's a huge amount of public support for a deposit return system. We've seen that since we launched our campaign back in 2015 and it's grown uh, as we've learned more about the proposals from the Scottish Government. So I think that shows us that um, members of the public are, are keen to do something uh, and they welcome these ambitious proposals. And anything on um, the externalities of... of um of products just yeah um i i just say on that i think it's a particular issue when you look at the um, the environmental impacts of, of food products um, there is a risk that um, policymakers try to address the environmental impacts from from agriculture by placing um, additional restrictions or regulatory burdens on um, producers domestically uh, in some cases that might actually be the right approach but you what you risk doing is increasing the price of, of domestic production, um, uh, encouraging um, uh, imports from, from other economies, um, particularly economies which may be at risk of, of, of deforestation. Um, so uh, in the food sector, I think there, is a, um, there are strong arguments in favour of, of um, uh, instruments that are focused specifically on consumption rather than production. But then you need to address the, the social equity challenges of the fact that you know, food makes up a significantly greater proportion of the budget, the household budgets of, of poorer households. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very important question. I think progressively economies are going to have to start addressing the agriculture and land use sector uh, in tackling climate change. And there are some really challenging um, uh, you know, social consumption and, and, and cultural challenges to that which need to be addressed sooner rather than later. We've, we've looked at um, what's possible and what's not, not possible uh, in, in this country, and, and Jenny actually uh, mentioned, um, uh, gave a good example of the recyclable cup scheme in Cologne, uh, and I actually saw a similar system in Copenhagen in December with the reverse vending machines. Um, so, you know, it's, um, it, it's certainly uh, possible and out there, but uh, turning to the fiscal um, approaches, um, are there any examples of, of fiscal approaches in, in, in other countries that have been implemented uh, or are being developed to further uh, sustainable development? That you're aware of. Jacqueline. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shall I? Um, 
Very, very many, I think is the short answer to that. There are very, very many countries in the OECD who have um, implemented environmental taxes on almost any product um, that you care to mention or to think about in the context of um, climate change or sustainable development. We can send through um, papers afterwards which provide examples from um, OECD countries which would, um, yeah, fulfil that knowledge gap there. Okay, no specific examples you can give us today, though. Well, um, there are um, a number of examples um, in uh, our splendid um, IEP report, Capacity Building for Environmental Tax Reform, which I will um, send through to the, uh, the clerks of the committee, um, looking at um, uh, air pollution charges, um, pay-as-you-throw schemes, uh, particularly in um, uh, Belgium and the, the Netherlands, um, uh, Char charges on um, agricultural inputs um, which cause uh, water quality um, issues, particularly pesticides and, and fertilizers. Um, and uh, you know, I, could, um, I, could, I could roll off a long list, but I think that the best thing to do is for us to communicate that, that report to you. And it provides um, lots of detailed case studies and attempts to draw some of the general messages from uh, what has worked and what hasn't worked. And there is also um, uh, lots of lots of work that uh, Green Budget Europe has, has done in in the same field, um, looking at uh, at similar examples. So, yeah, there there is much to learn from there, um, and I think um, increasingly what we'd what we'd like to see is um, parts of the UK uh, continuing to demonstrate that they can uh, they can lead on environmental tax reform and create uh, the sorts of examples that uh, that other economies then follow. Okay, if you could send these documents on, we'll read them with interest. Thanks. Before we round up, is there anything that the panel would like to highlight that they haven't had a chance to um, in this in this area with our questioning? We don't always cover manage to cover absolutely everything. Is there anything that you particularly want us to know about? I'd just yeah. say that um, uh, on balance, I think uh, an incineration tax is a good idea to ensure that you're internalising the full environmental impacts of all uh, waste management activities. Okay. Yes. I'm just coming back um, to one of the questions that was asked earlier about employment. I think one of the things is no matter what the fiscal measure or the package of uh, measures that we're putting in place here around the circular economy and climate change is to try and make sure that the employment opportunities and the infrastructure are in, are in Scotland. And um, one of the things that Zero Waste Scotland is doing is working in partnership with um, the Scottish Enterprise and uh, um, Skills Development Scotland, Education Scotland, etc., on what we need to do in terms of training and skills for a more circular economy. Um, so that work has started, and we need to recognise that there will be some some skills that we need to adapt to 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 make the most of those benefits and in infrastructure. Okay, and um, Michael, can just a, a detailed point around the imminent rollout of DRS. Um, hugely supportive of that as an initiative. Delighted to see that the, the plan published by the Scottish Government recently includes the possibility of individuals donating their deposit to charity. Um, we think there would be real benefits in uh, take up and that compound effect of the environmental benefits if, if it was encouraged to, for that to be an environmental charity, a local charity, so that people can see that instead of littering that bottle, <laughs> um, that bottle is actually supporting uh, a, a local community environmental project. Okay. Yes. I think one thing that um, I didn't really touch on very much was talking about um, road transport and ways that congestion, for example, which is one of the largest causes of external costs from the transport sector, can be tackled by fiscal policy. So thinking about congestion charging and road tolls, certainly something going forward um, for the committee to pick up on. But I think it was something that we didn't really discuss here today. So. Okay. for future reference. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank you all very much for your time today. I'm going to suspend this meeting briefly to allow you to leave. <laughs>
Welcome back. The next item of the agenda is for the committee to consider a legislative consent memorandum relating to the Wild Animals and Circuses Number no. 2 Bill, which is a UK Parliament Bill. Do any members have any comments on the LCM? Stuart. Um, just a tiny comment. I, I very much welcome this. Um, my, my tiny comment uh, relates to that uh, although we had no travelling circuses in Scotland, my constituency uh, had been the home of many wild animals overwintering. And the, this change in the regulations that is proposed here in particular uh, would finally close off that particular uh, abuse of wild animals. So overall, I very much welcome this. Come then. Claudia. Uh, thank you, Vina. Just very briefly, um, we... we I hope we'll be reflecting as a committee, and I hope the Scottish Government will be considering, um, which I think they've made commitments to, to future issues around animal welfare and static circuses and, and other um, ways that we need to look at properly protecting uh, wild animals in the future. Thanks, Kevin. I just, uh, just echo uh, the, the comments that, that Stuart made with regards to the, 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 the concerns that some of us had when the... <coughs> the, the, the the bill went through this committee that there, there may be still potential for uh, certain types of wild animals to be kept and, perf and perform elsewhere. So that closes that loophole. So I welcome this. Great. Right, so we agreed that no further action is required we can, can, and we're content with the LCM as it stands. Agreed. Thank you. And we'll report on that basis. And uh, is the committee content to delegate the final sign off on the LCM report to myself? Yes. Thank you very much. Right, uh, next I item on our agenda today is to consider whether the Environment EU Exit um, Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulations 2019 and the Environmental Assessment EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019 have been laid under the correct procedure. Both instruments have been laid under the negative procedure. Any comments on that? Seems We're all content. Um, so we're all content for the instruments to be considered under the negative procedure and uh, if you're content we'll set these instruments will be considered as the next part next agenda item and we'll turn to that now so the fourth item in the agenda is to consider those negative instruments do I have to read them out again I will just to be on the safe side Environment EU Exit Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulations 2019 and the Environmental Assessment EU Exit Scotland Amendment Regulations 2019. Are there any comments in relation to either of those instruments? There aren't. And we don't want to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments. We agreed on that. Okay. That concludes the committee's business in public today. At its next meeting on the 11th of June, the committee will take evidence as part of its marine inquiry. The committee will look at the current state of Scotland's marine environment and examine opportunities to protect and enhance marine biodiversity in Scotland. We'll now move on to private session and ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of this meeting is now closed. <laughs> <laughs>